Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So this week, um, we're not really working on prerequisite material uh, because there there isn't really much in the way of prerequisite material that directly helps with what we're doing in the parent class. Instead, what I wanted to do in our support class this week was use our time to uh, just kind of get a little bit more practice working with intersections and unions of sets. So <clears throat> what I wanted to do was start with a recap on what uh, unions and intersections of sets look like as far as Venn diagrams are concerned. So if you have two sets, A and B, um, this is kind of your general uh, Venn diagram for that. The U here represents the universe that we're working in, the universal set. And A union B is the set of all elements uh, that are contained in either set A or set B. So the Venn diagram looks like this. Everything from A and everything from B is, is shaded. Okay, <clears throat> the intersection of A and B is the set of all elements that, the, uh, that belong to both A and B at the same time. <coughs> so in this case, we don't shade all of A and all of B. We only shade the intersecting part of that region or the, uh, the intersecting uh, region of these two sets because everything in that intersecting region would be an element that belongs to A and B simultaneously. Okay, the Venn diagrams are a good way of visualizing these these sets. So to get this practice in, and this is going to be a, a relatively short one this week, um, <clears throat> I want to start by looking at um, three sets, A, B, and C, described using the different types of um, representations we've seen so far. So I have one set given to me in roster notation, one is given in set builder notation, and one is given to me a, as a description in words. So we're going to say that set A is the set containing the numbers 10, 20, 30, and 40. Set B is the set of all x such that x is an integer and x is between 20 and 50 inclusive on both ends. Um, so I, I could write this one relatively easily in roster notation, but uh, I would either have to, to write a lot of numbers because this is literally the numbers 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, all the way up to 50, or I could use an ellipsis if I wanted to write it uh, in, in a little bit more of a shorthand. Um, but this one is given to us in set builder. And then C is the set of all multiples of 10 less than 100. And I'm going to actually add a little something to this. Um, I'm going to say the set of all positive multiples of 10, because otherwise this would be an infinite set. Negative 10, negative 20, negative 30, those are actually multiples of 10 as well. So this this will make it so we're just dealing with the numbers 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. Those are the numbers that belong to the set C. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me, our goal here is to write some sets that are given to us as either unions, intersections, or as we're going to see, a combination of those um, in roster notation. So starting with this first one, a union B. <clears throat> Let's go back to the description of set A and set B. A and B is are, are these sets here. 10, 20, 30, 40, those are the numbers in A. B is the set of all integers from 20 to 50 inclusive. So the union of these two sets is the set that contains everything in A as well as everything in B. It's both of those sets thrown into one larger set. So um, the, the small, if I wanted to list these in order, you know, from smallest to biggest, say, then the, the smallest number would have been a 10, because 10 doesn't appear in set B. Everything in B is larger than 10. A contains the number 20, and so does B. So 20 is a common element in both sets, but we don't list it twice. I don't list the 20 from A and the 20 from B, so it's a 20, 20 here. I just write the 20 one time. And then take a look at this. <clears throat> everything else that belongs to B, or sorry, everything else that belongs to A is also an element of B. So we've accounted for 10, but 20, 30, and 40 are all integers that are between 20 and 50 inclusive. So what this means is that uh, all three of these numbers are kind of going to be thought of as like duplicates in the sense that they also appear here. And so I can kind of just think about what's left in B that we haven't accounted for. Well, remember B is the set of all integers between 20 and 50 inclusive. So that would include 20, 21, 22. And I'm not actually going to write every single one because that's tedious and unnecessary. I'm going to use my uh, ellipsis to just carry me all the way out to 50. 
Okay, and that indicates that this is counting its way up to 50. It's following this pattern. This 10 is not a part of this pattern. This 10 is just lumped in from, from set A. But then after that, we kind of have this counting pattern here. So this is one way of writing A union B, probably the, one of the more efficient ways of doing it. <clears throat> Let's take a look at um, B intersect C. What does the intersection of B and C look like in roster notation? <coughs> Excuse me, still getting over this cough. So uh, B, like we said, is the set of all integers between 20 and 50 inclusive. C contains some of the elements that are in this set as well. And that's what we're looking for when we talk about intersections. We want common elements between these two sets. C contains the set of all positive multiples of 10 less than 100. And like we said, that's 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way up to 90. <clears throat> so if I'm looking for common elements, since all of the elements of C are multiples of 10, then the intersection can only contain multiples of 10, right? Because whatever is in this intersection has to belong to both of these sets. Um, but it, because the uh, elements of this intersection also have to belong to B, not only are we looking for multiples of 10, but we're specifically looking for multiples of 10 that are between 20 and 50 inclusive. So that would include these numbers, 20, 30, 40, 50. <clears throat> and you can verify these numbers are exactly the elements that belong to both B and C at the same time. Okay? All right. <coughs> this one's a tad trickier because we're using all three sets this time. And notice that I included some parentheses here. What that means is exactly what it means in order of operations that you learn all the way back in arithmetic. It says do this first. So when I'm looking at this, A union B intersect C. I'm looking at the union of A and B first. I want to determine what that set looks like and then take that new set and form the intersection of it with C. Now we've already found the union of these two sets, A union B, up here. That was the first thing that we did. So luckily we already have that exact set to look at for comparison. Um, I want the intersection of this set with the set C. And remember C is the set of all multiples of 10, positive multiples of 10 less than 100. Well, notice that this set already contains positive numbers that are less than 100. So in order for them to also belong to set C, the only thing that's left to check is which of these numbers are also multiples of 10. That's the defining criteria for C that we haven't verified yet. So these numbers uh, no, don't get any smaller than 10, don't get any bigger than 50, and uh, they do include 10, 20. It would also include 30 and 40 in this ellipsis here. We just didn't write it. Um, and 50 as well. Those are all of the multiples of 10 that would be contained there. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 would be those elements. Now, if you want to, I, I want to just call attention to how I did these problems. I didn't do a lot of math off to the side. I didn't draw Venn diagrams. I kind of talked my way through each one. And that's not the only way to approach these, but I think with, with this type of problem, it's probably one of the better ways um, because really it's you want to reduce this to logic. You want to think of this in terms of and and or. Think of the union as the word or. We're looking for elements that belong to set A or set B. They don't need to belong to both, they just need to belong to one or the other. They could belong to both, but th that's not necessary. Um, <clears throat> intersections, we think of as the word and. If I have set B and set C, I'm just looking for which elements belong to both B and C at the same time. And then we can combine those, those words and that, that reasoning for more complicated problems like this. But again, I kind of talked my way through it, and the words and and or can be kind of you know, key words for you when you're doing problems like this. Okay, I only have a couple more that I want to do, and these are going to be uh, true-false types of problems. So um, these ones, again, it kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of logic and how well you understand what these set operations mean. So each of these are just answering true or false. The first one says, if X is an element of A and X is an element of B, then the intersection of A and B is not equal to the empty set. Is this true or false? So <clears throat> these true-false questions might be a little bit daunting at first because now we're not looking at specific sets. I'm not listing the elements of A or the elements of B. This is a little bit higher level of abstraction. 
And so what we need to do is rely on our understanding of what these set operations mean, and this is where the Venn diagrams are kind of useful. Okay, so notice the, the operation that's being used here is an intersection. Let's go back and look at the Venn diagram for what an intersection looks like. It's this guy, it's the overlapping region, okay? So uh, here's what we know. This is called our premise, and this would be called our conclusion. We're gonna deal with if-then statements in much more detail in chapter three when we study uh, symbolic logic. There's a lot of relationships between uh, chapter two and chapter three. Um, <clears throat> if X belongs to A and X belongs to B, notice it's, it's, it's X both times. So that means I'm talking about the same element here and here. Okay, what this is telling me, this premise, is saying that there is an element in A that is also in B. That would put this element X right there in the overlapping region between these two sets. And then the conclusion says A intersect B, or the intersection of A and B is not equal to the empty set. Or another way of saying that is the intersection is non-empty. Well, I can see that that's true, because in order for the intersection to not be the empty set, there has to be at least one element in it. Remember, the empty set is the set containing no elements at all. So if we can find something in that intersection, then it can't be the empty set. But our premise establishes that X is in that intersection. So this is a true statement. That intersection would not be empty because we found an element in the intersection. That's true. I left myself way more space than I needed to. Let's circle that. Okay, let's take a look at one more. <clears throat> Excuse me. This one says... If X is not an element, that's that element sign with a, with a slash through it. If X is not an element of A, then X is not an element of A union B. Is this true or false? So once again, we have a premise and a conclusion. If this conclusion follows from this premise, in other words, if this is true, then this must be true, that means this statement is true. So can we say that this statement is true or false? Well, if X is not an element of A, does that automatically mean that X cannot be in the union of these two sets? On the outset, it might appear that that's the case, but in, as it turns out, that's actually not true. And here's why. <clears throat> Remember what A union B is. We have the Venn diagram for it here. Anything in that shaded region belongs to that union. So if this says X does not belong to A, well, <laughs> there's a couple of ways that X cannot belong to A. If X was out here, then I can see that X does not belong to A, right? It's not inside the circle representing the set A. And if, it, if this were the case, then this conclusion would be true because the way that I wrote it, it's also outside of the union of those two sets. But what if instead of putting X there, what if I put X here, okay? Is X outside of the set A? It is, it's outside of the circle representing the set A. So this premise is true if I put X here, but then the conclusion becomes false because even though X is outside of A, it's still inside of B. And remember, everything from A and B ends up in the union. So this would not be true in this case. Now, in a, in a, this is something that we call a conditional statement or an if-then statement. If you can find any case where the conclusion does not follow from the premise, then the statement is false. It doesn't matter that there's some cases where this conclusion becomes true. If it's ever not, if this ever doesn't follow from this, it's false. So that shows that this statement is false, okay? Now, <clears throat> um, I just put true and false, and I kind of talked through the reasoning with, with a Venn diagram. On the assignment for this week, there's, uh, I think, five true-false questions for you, kind of of this type. Um, not these exact ones, but very similar. And I'm not looking for you to prove whether it's true or false. I'm not looking for work specifically. You kind of think through it yourself and give your best answer, okay? But that's kind of the way you want to think about it. The Venn diagrams really help with these. Uh, that's going to wrap up intersections and unions.